Well, good morning. Hope you're all well. It's a wild, woolly day here in Minnesota. And uh, this is the first live attempt that I'm making here on Facebook. And uh, part of it is because of this movie that I saw over the weekend. Good morning, Bob. My wife likes to go out and see movies, and I like to stay in and watch movies. And so when she takes me out to see a movie in the theater, it's quite the thrill. And um, good morning, Todd. And uh, <laughs> we saw this movie yesterday uh, on Friday. The movie is called Yesterday, and it was on Friday we watched it. And if you haven't seen the, basically that the young man who loves the music of the Beatles gets hit by a bus and by some miraculous event, he gets knocked into an alternate universe where there are no Beatles at all. They never existed. And so he becomes famous and uh, very rich and wealthy because of the ability to sing these songs that he remembers and nobody else knows doing the music of the Beatles. But he has to make a sacrifice in order to do that. He has to give up his home ways there in uh, Suffolk and uh, and basically go to Los Angeles and become rich and famous. And I really enjoy this movie a great deal. It's a very charming movie to watch and a very good date movie if you want a date movie. But it is also, I think, a, fan, a fascinating piece of artwork because what it does is it does what I love called mythopoeic speculation. That's a term that Bernard Bato created. And I've, I've said it so many times now that my students groan every time that I mention it. It's a, it's a term that I like to throw around to make myself look smart. Mythopoeic speculation is basically the idea that as human beings, we don't tell new stories. We basically recycle the old stories and tell them over and over again in different forms. So every story that we have is a reconstituting of an earlier story. And this one I thought was fantastic in retelling the story of the Arthurian cycle, the Arthur and Lancelot and Guinevere and Percival and, and Gawain and all those characters from medieval mythology made great by Thomas Mallory's work, Le Morte d'Arthur. And it reminded me a great deal of the movie, The Natural. Uh, that was, I came out I think, in the 1980s. And um, it was a fantastic movie. It wasn't about baseball. I mean, only mildly about baseball. It was actually about the round table, about Arthur and the Knights. Even the, um, even the, the name of the team was the Knights. And you had Pop Fisher as the Fisher King. And you had uh, Robert Redford as the Parsifal character. And you had the, even the Lilith character that shows up and tries to seduce him and take away his power. But this movie was very similar because uh, it took a subject which was mundane. It was every day. It was like the, the Beatles are ubiquitous. You know, their music is all over. And, and, and you're right. It is archetypes, Todd. That's the term, of course, that Carl Jung uses, the archetypes. And the, the imagery in this movie was very archetypal. I think the Beatles, in many ways, their music has become the, the, the movie itself yesterday was a charming little story, a romance story. And I thought just very well played. The, the lead actors, uh, Himesh Patel and Lily James, played fantastic characters, really very fine um, imagery there. And, and delightful that in the end, you know, everything's happy and you sing Obla Di, Obla Da at the end and all that. But um, these, these uh, actors and directors and they were all, they seemed to be involved in a greater story than just the Beatles. And that's why I say this was a form of mythopoeic speculation. Because in this story, uh, you had um, the character choosing to take the, the grail. Uh, it's even offered to him. I think at one point, one of the characters, actually a, a, a fantastic character, um, what was her name? Hammer, I think, was the last name of the character. Deborah Hammer. Oh, yeah, Kate McKinnon. Kate McKinnon does such a fantastic job playing this, this character, the agent from L.A. And she even says, you're going to be taking the poisoned chalice, and you have to choose between the poisoned chalice and the, and the girl back home. And the main character of the story, uh, the Jack Malik character, 
uh, played by Himesh Patel, he chooses the, the grail. He chooses to go after the grail. And the grail represents all that fame and fortune and, and beauty and glitter and all that high gloss life of, of L.A. And he chooses it because he thinks that's what I want to do. That's, 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 where the, that's where the money is. You know? That's where the life really is. And what he realizes in the movie is that that's not where life is at all. That actually life is in this loving this young lady loving this beautiful girl back home who's always been like a sister to him, who's always been present to him, but he's never really noticed or never really acknowledged that he actually loves her. And in the end of the story, I won't give away the whole story, but at the end of the story, he makes a choice which brings him great happiness, not fame and fortune, but great happiness. And I thought that's why this is a retelling of the Grail story. It's a trope. It's, you know, the trope is where you turn or twist an idea slightly, change it from its original form. And that's where Barnard Bateau says the mythopoeic speculation is, specializes in this, taking something that's familiar and turning it, changing it or altering it. So in this story, uh, you have even the, the girl, her name is Ellie. And that harkens back to the image of Elaine in the story of Arthur and Lancelot. In the Arthur story, if you're not familiar with that, Arthur is paralleled by his best knight, Lancelot. And Lancelot is seeking after the grail. But what he doesn't realize is that the grail is really right in front of him. It's this character, Elaine, the, a beautiful woman who loves him and wants to make a life with him. He's uh, fame, fortune, power, and he like he he locates it in the character of Guinevere, who is the wife of Arthur. And so Lancelot in Mallory's story and the others fails at the quest. He can't find the Grail. In fact, there's a scene where he falls asleep, and he and he wakes up after seeing the Grail in a dream, and he runs around the Grail Chapel, but he can't get in. And there's another scene where he puts out his hand to try and steady the grail, and he causes the entire vision of the grail procession to disappear. So technically, he's a failure at the grail quest. And the, the story of is Lancelot, who fails at the grail quest, also fails at happiness. He doesn't notice that there's this beautiful girl right there in front of him. A normal life. Wife, house, children, all that. He thinks that the grail is something greater than that, something more beautiful, something beyond this world. And indeed, in Mallory's wonderful retelling of it, the grail imagery, the quest of the grail imagery, is a quest for human perfection. It represents all that mathematical beauty, um, artwork and all of that song and all of that intellectual perfection and martial strength that the round table was actually created in order to find. And um, that finding of the grail, which is actually done by Galahad, the son of Lancelot, the finding of the grail actually becomes the destruction of Camelot. I mean, technically the destruction comes because Lancelot pursues Guinevere. But really the grail is both the the apex of the round table and its destruction. Because right after the finding of the grail, you have the dissolution, the civil war and the dissolution of the whole of Camelot. The greatest thing humans are capable of creating, civilization, it falls apart. But it also falls apart because Lancelot doesn't recognize that his grail is really not the pursuit of that greater otherworldly Mm, metaphysical thing. His pursuit ought to have been the pursuit of the woman who really did love him. His pursuit of a happiness with the woman who cared about him. And in this story, the movie, Yesterday, the main character uh, has because he thinks that his whole glory and honor and um, success, if you will, 
is going to be located not in Ellie, Ellie Appleton, not in being a local phenomenon, not in being a, a humble, lowly teacher. He thinks it's going to be in being the greatest songwriter ever, in being this incredibly popular, powerful, loved by millions type of person. And I don't want to give away the ending because you really, you really ought to see this movie. It's quite, quite flick and a great date movie. But essentially, his choice leads him to have to accept or reject the real grail, which is the love of that person that is meant for him. I thought also in this movie it was fascinating how they put up the uh, the glitz and the glamour and the glory of L.A., of um, finding a life uh, there with popularity, as so attractive. It really was. Uh, and the music of the Beatles was so attractive. And they set it up life of, of normalcy in a really interesting way because they actually have him go and visit John Lennon at one point in the movie. And they did this partly using CGI, but also partly using a, a, a double. And it's just a great scene because Lennon is an old man in this movie and he lives out on the coast uh, all by himself in a little house. And he has lived his whole life with the woman he loves in a job that's fulfilling and he is quite peaceful. And, and we all know that John Lennon didn't live that way. <laughs> Because he, uh, as great an artist as he was, he was a really tortured man. And he ended up being, um, I think, a rather miserable man. Um, and eventually he was shot. He was killed. He was murdered. And so he died rather young. But in this movie, that doesn't happen because there is no Beatles. There is no fame and fortune for the Beatles. And so it, it gives a contrast here, I think, between fame and fortune, which is going to cause misery it's going to cause agony it's going to cause perhaps even a young death an early death and that long-lived life of what most people would consider ignominy of most people consider to be nothing you know who, who who are you you do your job every day and you come home to the family and that's it right where's the glory in that who's praising you there who's giving you likes for just doing your darn job well the movie kind of points out after that grail of the metaphysical that's great but it's going to cause you agony and if you don't want agony if you want real happiness if you want real joy and love and the the honor of of, of a handful of people then you you don't seek that happiness and that glory and and folks this got me in the feels you know got, got me right there i was very verklempt um <laughs> Because I, I think that everybody who has a vision of the glory and beauty of culture or of life or how great things could be has a longing to want. That's part of the reason you go into teaching. If you go into teaching for the right reasons, it's because you want to pass this on to other people. You want to inculcate in them a love that you have for these beautiful things you've seen. So there's always that temptation. Always this like like apple hanging out there that also says, yes, and you can be worshipped too. You can be loved and adored by millions. You'll change the world. That's not the reason to do it. You know, if you, if you go into it thinking you're going to change the world, you're going to end up destroying Camelot. I temptation to revolutionize everything which is really it's a it's a temptation to be godlike and thus similar to the eden story um, and similar if i may say so to galadriel's temptation in the lord of the rings if you go into it to be godlike and to alter the entire culture you will not do so you may go down in history perhaps as being you know in history books or uh, the, the greatest band ever but you you will be you'll be miserable so what do you choose like achilles right from the iliad what do you choose do you choose a short life of great fame glory or do you choose a long life of ignominy being unknown the first one won't provide happiness 
but it will provide fame and glory and riches and wealth and the adulation of screaming young fans. The second one won't provide any of that fame and glory, but you might live a very happy, fulfilling life with the person you love and die very contented down by the sea in a little shack. So I thought this movie was incredibly powerful. Uh, it was a, a sort of an under the radar movie, like the movie, The Natural because it looks as though it's talking about an, an issue which is mundane, commonplace every day. And really it embodies in that every day something very fundamental to human existence. Powerful, I thought, powerful. Thanks, y'all. I'm keeping it brief this morning. Um, stay safe, stay well. God bless all.